Hello, today this is my great pleasure at the Microbiome Foundation to be interviewing Professor Rosie krishmalnik brown and Professor Jim Adams, who have been conducting fantastic research in the field of autism with a very innovative approach um, based on the microbiome. Recently, a lot of research has linked the functioning of the brain with the functioning of the gut microbiome. And it has established that there is a permanent communication between the guts and the brain, um, which therefore means that in many neurological conditions, and specifically today as we're talking about autism in neurodevelopment uh, conditions such as um, ASD, the microbiome has a, an effect, a profound effect on uh, the state of the, the brain. So the therapy that we're going to be talking to um, you about today is called microbiota transfer therapy, which is basically transferring the microbiome of a healthy donor to uh, a patient with autism with very interesting results, which Rosie and James will be talking to us uh, about. So the idea of this interview today is both to get a better understanding of what this microbiota transfer therapy is about, how it works, and what sort of results it has produced in uh, this clinical trial, this phase one clinical trial, but also to understand how uh, this approach could potentially be a treatment in the following years for uh, autism. So we're very happy to hear from you, Rosie and James, today about the subject, and uh, we'd be happy for you to introduce yourselves. Thank you very much. Rosie, go ahead. Uh, I'm Rosa Krahmanik Brown. I'm a professor in the School of Sustainable Engineering and the Built Environment, which really translates to environmental engineering. That's my background. I'm an environmental engineer by training. But I have always worked with microorganisms for environmental engineering to provide services for society. I work with microbes that can uh, transform uh, pollutants and make them not toxic anymore. I work with microbes that can produce energy. And I, I've worked in the gut microbiome for the last um, 12 years. Uh, I, have, I have always worked also with genomic-based techniques to analyze uh, microbial communities, how microbes communicate with each other and with their environment. And this has been very helpful for um, the gut microbiome. And I have been uh, lucky and fortunate to have been working with Jim Adams on autism and the microbiome for about 10 years already. Okay. Thank you, Rosa. And like Rosie, I'm an engineer by background, but because I have a daughter with autism, 20 years ago, I switched most of my research to focus on autism. We've looked at uh, many different areas of autism, the causes of it, the, how to prevent it, how to treat it. And um, you know, one of the major areas we've worked on is microbiota transplant to try to treat gut problems in children with autism. And I've been so pleased to work with uh, Rosie on this work. Okay, fantastic. Um, so first question um, the Microbiome Foundation has for you is, uh, how did you get to this um, approach of the microbiome for um, autism spectrum disorder? What is the, the underlying rationale and how did do the gut and the brain uh, in effect communicate to um, be able to uh, research a therapy based on, um, on this? transplantation that you're going to talk to us about? Um, so I'm going to answer it, and Jim, if you want to add after my answer, that's okay. Um, I'm going to say I started working on autism and the microbiome. A simple answer is because of Jim. Uh -huh. uh, but a more uh, involved answer is that I had been working already on the microbiome and um, bariatric surgery, how bariatric surgery changed the microbiome. I had the methods to explore the gut microbiome um, and after having a few conversations with Jim, I learned that uh, a big percentage of kids with autism have a lot of gastrointestinal issues. And I also learned also through him that there was a study uh, in 2000 uh, from Sanders et al. that showed that kids with autism that were treated with vancomycin, um, while they were being treated with vancomycin, their, their behavior improved. Um, after the vancomycin treatment, they regressed, but through the treatment, their behavior was much better. So to me, that was two scientific points that, that told me that this was a question worth investigating. What is the microbiome doing um, in autism? In the beginning, I thought I wasn't 
an expert on gut brain communication and I just thought if we could resolve some of those gastrointestinal issues and that will improve behavior and that will improve their lifestyle, that's enough. You know, if we can at least help these children by resolving these gastrointestinal issues, that's enough. But then through my both obesity work and autism work, I have learned a lot about how the, the gut communicates with the brain, which is really a two-way interaction. It's a gut brain and brain gut communication. Uh, but of course, we're studying it from the gut to the brain. Um, the gut communicates to the brain, brain physically and chemically. Physically, there's a nerve that connects the gut with the neurons and with the central nervous system, which is a vagus nerve. Um, on the obesity area, we know that um, there are signals that come to the gut that tell our brain if we're hungry or we're satisfi satisfied. And some of these signals actually also, microbes are involved in uh, producing or consuming some of these chemicals. But besides that, there's many microbes that have in implications with the communication of the gut and the brain, like anxiety, depression, some other ne ne neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, so I, <laughs> have worked with microbes for a long time, like I said before, and I know very well that in anaerobic conditions, microbes um, can produce commonly short-chain fatty acids. Short-chain fatty acids are acetate, propionate, butyrate. These are the key ones. And butyrate fits the colonocytes and butyrate also has been implicated in, in some of these um, uh, conditions. But they're also, microorganisms also produce um, precursors to common neurotransmitters. For example, most of the people might have heard about tryptophan and serotonin. So tryptophan, a lot of the tryptophan produced in our gut is by microbes. Um, so microorganisms can change the chemicals, can change the food that we eat and produce either neurotransmitters or um, molecules that have neuroactive features or consume them. And so that's a very interesting uh, interaction when we get more into the science. And so I don't know if you wanna to add to this, Jim. Well, I think you gave a great overview. I just look at it a little more simply that I think the way we, I started is that about 30 to 50% of uh, children and adults with autism have chronic long lasting GI problems that are very resistant to standard. Mm -hmm. And we found that the more severe GI problems correlated with more severe autism symptoms. So our hope that if we can treat those GI symptoms, we may be able to reduce uh, the autism symptoms. In addition to what Rosie mentioned, just the pain and discomfort of chronic constipation, chronic diarrhea are often alternating between the two is another factor. Our gut bacteria produce key vitamins, which we need for uh, our whole body metabolism, and also they regulate the immune system. And there's been speculation that uh, neuroinflammation may be part of what's involved in autism. So it's very complex. We have a lot to learn. Our t we coined the term microbiota transplant therapy because it's similar to fecal transplant, but it's special in the way in which we do it. So fecal transplant is very well known for treating a condition called Clostridium difficile, or C. diff. It affects about 500,000 people in the U.S., kills 29,000 Americans a year through very severe um, diarrhea. It can be treated with antibiotics, but it often comes back again and again. And it's been discovered that taking gut bacteria from a healthy person and putting it into a person with C. diff uh, cures them in just a few days, usually uh, with about 90% of the time. So it's just an amazingly effective treatment for C. diff. And now it's being used, it's been used for over 50,000 people in the U.S. Um, people who have had uh, uh, recurrent C. diff infection. So it's very, very promising for that condition. It's also been utilized for many other GI conditions, such as ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, irritable bowel uh, disorder, uh, constipation. But in those conditions, the uh, beneficial rate, the cure rate is much lower. And so we think that for those conditions, you need to do a much longer term treatment. So our collaborator, Tom Barodi in Australia, first treated nine children with autism with microbiota transplant. He found they were much harder to treat than C. diff patients. 
So he treated them every day for three months. So for C. diff, one dose, one time. For autism, daily doses for three months and he found improvements in GI symptoms and improvements in autism symptoms. Developed our microbiota transplant therapy with his input. <clears throat> it basically involves two weeks of vancomycin, an antibiotic to kill off harmful bacteria, and day bowel cleanse to remove any remaining bacteria, and then weeks of microbiota transplant um, in order to reseed the gut with beneficial bacteria from healthy, carefully screened donors. So although it's similar to fecal transplant, we don't want people to get the idea of just one dose. Rather, it's this combination of antibiotic pretreatment, a bowel cleanse, and then daily treatment for eight weeks. And we slowly, gradually saw improvements in uh, symptoms. So you, you touch a very important subject that um, this cannot be taken lightly. Um, I usually, when I talk to any parents, I said, do not try this at home. The microbiota that is gonna be used needs to be very well screened. Uh, we do not produce the microbiota. The microbiota is produced for us by our collaborators in Minnesota, Alex Kuhertz and Mike Sadowski. Well, we know that they screen really well the patients. They have a very intensive um, medical questionnaire. They screen them so well that we've heard only about 10% of Americans pass that screening. They have to be super healthy, fit, um, no um, mental conditions. They have to be really good. And besides screening the patients, they also screen the microbiota. They, um, they screen the patients and then once the patients do the donation, they, um, they have a few assays for known pathogens. Um, they actually also screen for um, antibiotic resistance genes, which was an issue in the United States uh, recently. That would be another issue if you transfer microbes that are antibiotic resistant uh, from the donor, that would be a big issue. So they've been screening even before this happened for antibiotic resistance genes, they've been screening for pathogens. And they also um, um, kind of quarantine the donation. They don't use it right away. They make sure that the don donor is fine for a few weeks before using um, the fecal sample. And then it's, uh, it's, it's very, the donors are screened, the donation is screened, and it's purified. Um, so I, it's not any poop, which is another reason why this approach is a little bit different because we're not using poop, we're using microbes that come from fecal samples, but we're not using fecal samples. We're using intestinal microbiota. I think that's how Alex likes to call it, intestinal microbiota, not fecal microbiota. Okay. Um, and, and it has to be done this way because, and under um, medical supervision, otherwise it can lead to bad effects. You can transfer pathogens, you can transfer antibiotic resistant genes. Um, so, um, it's a good, it's a good and important question, but that's how we have been doing it. And so far, thank God we've been successful. Of course, and I appreciate you asking because um, when parents see your results, they think that they can just do it at home and try any donor and this is not the right approach and it could be dangerous. It could lead to really bad gastrointestinal infections. Um, so we, we, I, I often tell any reporter, any interview I have, I said, if they said, did I miss anything? And I said, please do not try this at home. This needs to be with the right microbiota under the right supervision, because you don't want to, you want to transfer the good microbes and make sure that that's what you're transferring. So our original study was for 18 children with autism, ages 7 to 16, who had moderate to severe uh, GI issues. Um, and our goal was to try to treat both the GI issues and the autism symptoms, because we thought they were very connected based on previous research, including our work. So um, we uh, conducted the microbiota transplant therapy, and at the end of the 10 weeks of treatment, we found a very large, about 80% reduction in GI symptoms. So um, chronic constipation, chronic diarrhea, in either case, it improved uh, greatly. 
Um, so 16 out of 18 children had great improvements. Only two did not improve much on GI symptoms. And also took a little bit longer. Uh, we saw improvements in autism symptoms, about a, initially about a 23% improvement. And then we waited because in previous study with vancomycin, um, it was found that the benefits were just temporary, that after stopping treatment in a few weeks, the benefits disappeared. We waited eight weeks, longer than in the Vanco study, and we were very pleased to see the GI benefits and autism benefits remain. There was no loss of benefit. Um, and then we also, uh, through uh, Rosie's measurements, discovered that there was initially a low diversity and later on an increase in diversity at the end of treatment. And Rosie can talk more about that later. Um, but then a year later, several families came up to us and said, Gee, my son's doing better than ever. That was when we did our follow-up study. And so two years after treatment had stopped, we followed up with every one of the participants. We were very lucky that none of them had dropped out during the study. Every one of them agreed to be followed up. We found that most of the GI benefits remained. A couple people had lost some benefits, um, but GI benefits. But family after family reported that their auti child's autism symptoms had just slowly, steadily continued to improve. They just seemed to be able to learn better. And our professional evaluator said that instead of a 23% reduction at the end of treatment, there is now a 47% a reduction in autism symptoms. This is an open label study. There's some placebo effect, but much of the benefits seem to be real. And so at the start of the study, 80% of the participants were um, in the category of severe autism. At the end of treatment, less than 20%, excuse me, at the end of the two-year follow-up, less than 20% were severe, roughly 40% were mild to moderate autism, and 40%, over 40% were below the cutoff for autism. So they still had some symptoms, but they had improved greatly. Yeah. So the microbiota transplant was very well tolerated. There were no adverse effects due to that. But we expected with the vancomycin treatment, as had been found in a previous study, uh, the first few days, about two-thirds of the children had a temporary worsening of behavior problems, worse hyperactivity or worse irritability. It usually lasted for just a few days. What's happening is as the bacteria, as the antibiotic is killing off, the harmful bacteria, they're releasing all their toxins all at once. So the symptoms the bacteria were causing were worsened. So that's our hypothesis. Um, but within just a few days, in most cases, in one case, a few weeks, those temporary adverse effects disappeared and the children began doing much better. So at the start of this study, 90% of the children had a huge improvement in GI symptoms. And it's a small study, so all we can say is you know, it's somewhat unclear why two of them did not improve, um, but 90% of them had a great improvement in GI symptoms. Um, we did observe that those who had the uh, larger improvement in GI symptoms long-term also tended to have more improvement in autism symptoms long-term. I'd like um, Rosie to answer the question also about the gut bacteria, if she could explain that a little bit more, because I think that's very important, giving us insight about the duration of the treatment. Um, Jim talked about what we saw behaviorally and based on GI symptoms, but another thing that we observed that it's very important is that we changed the microbiota. We changed the microbiota for these children, um, which um, it's also something not so easy to achieve. So A, we um, had seen in previous studies that kids with autism have lower diversity in the gut microbiota. Lo lower diversity is commonly perceived in the gut microbiome research, not just for autism, but for many other conditions as a bad thing. The, the more different types of microbes that you have in your gut, the more possibilities you have for good outcomes. Uh, so a low diversity is not good. We were able to increase the diversity for these children. 
um, and it increased even more at the two-year follow-up. So diversity went up and it went even farther up at the two-year follow-up. We were also able to see initially that the kids acquire the microbiota from the donors. We saw something that is called engraftment. They were during the treatment and at the end of treatment, they were more similar to the donors than they would be to an average other person. And they were more similar than the, we had kids as controlled that were not treated that were the same age and that were typically developing. So the kids with autism were more similar to the donor than one kid to another, one normal kid to another kid. And uh, we saw, uh, we have been um, also studying um, what are differences in kids with autism and typically development, de developing kids. And there's one microbe we've been following, Prevotella, which is a microbe associated to fiber consumption. Uh, we had seen this very depleted in kids with autism in, a, in the United States, specifically in Arizona. And we were able to increase dramatically the numbers of this Prevotella microbe during the treatment and after treatment. Uh, uh, amazingly enough, uh, at the two-year follow-up, the, the, the microbiota was different than the donor. They, they didn't seem as, as similar to the donor as they did at the end of treatment, but they still had very a new beneficial microbiota, their own new beneficial microbiota. They achieve a new my own microbiota that it's a beneficial one. They were able to acquire microbes uh, from food or from the environment that are beneficial and grow them, you know, in their, in their body. Beefy the bacteria is another microbe that we saw increases uh, off during the treatment. Um, this is known as a probiotic, as a commensal beneficial microbe. Um, so it was amazing that we were able to change the microbiota and that even though the change in itself was not the same thing two years later, but two years later, we could see that these, micro these kids were able to enhance their own microbiota after the treatment. What I think happened during the treatment is that we changed that gut environment. And by changing that gut environment, you, we made an environment that was more inviting for beneficial microbes. Um, and this is more important than adding good microbes because if you have a bad environment and you add good microbes, they're not gonna thrive. You need to have the right conditions for microbes to actually grow and thrive. This is, again, an open label study, so we need to be cautious, but the results are very strong. Uh, because of the results of our phase one study, the FDA uh, has granted us what's called fast track status, meaning that they recognize this is a promising, not proven, a promising treatment for an unmet need, both the GI symptoms and the core symptoms of autism. So again, we're, we're tracking both the core symptoms of autism, the language, the social interaction, the, uh, the repetitive behaviors, as well as many related symptoms, hyperactivity, irritability, et cetera. And so what's so surprising is we are seeing a large um, improvement in the core symptoms of autism, again, in an open label study. But yes, the effect size is very high, and I don't know of any study that has seen such a large uh, effect size before for core symptoms of autism. Um, except behavioral therapy is also a very promising therapy, but a very different one. But for medical therapies, this seems one of the most promising. We don't do formal follow-up on them because it's not part of our IRB. Even adding on the two-year follow-up wasn't part of our original plan. Um, what I can say is that a couple families have volunteered to speak to the media, and so they've continued to give very positive reports about how their children are doing. One man I spoke with a couple months ago, uh, his son is now in college. He said his son's doing very well. He asked his son about his gut symptoms and he said, oh, dad, that was eons ago, very long time ago. So he, he hasn't had any GI problems since. And so, every one of the children had had GI problems since infancy. They'd never had a period of normal GI health. So it was a dramatic change that we made. One of the children that participated in, us, in our study was a freshman at ASU this past year at the university where Jim and I are professors. And I never interact with the families, but I have seen them in videos when reporters ask to, um, to videotape them. Um, and in one of them, the child said that um, 
the reporter asked the child, what do you want to do when you grow up? And he said, I want to be a doctor because I want to help people. So we made sure that there were no changes in diet, therapies, medication, supplements for several months prior to the start of the study and during the treatment and eight week follow up. So there were no changes in those. Only a few of the children were on a special diet, typically a, a dairy free, gluten free diet, but that was only a small fraction of them. Um, after the eight week follow up, so after treatment had stopped, a few more families did make some in diet or medication. So in the two years following, they were able to make some changes. But in general, they felt that most of the changes were um, due to the uh, microbiota therapy itself. We could speculate, yes, uh, but I would say this is not a universal approach. I think um, it would be... Um, too simple to think that an FMT can cure anything and everything. So we could speculate that yes, because the gut brain interaction has implications for anxiety, for example, which you know uh, implicates uh, other um, um, etiologies of some of these other. Um, and um, having a better gut environment also might help produce chemicals that are important for ADHD, for example, for dyslexia, for sleeping, you know, production of melatonin is so important. And this is something that it's also initiated by, by microorganisms. So we could speculate that yes, this could work, um, but we don't know. Identifying the microbes and chemicals that are produced and that change with FMT can help, you know, can help for a more when we understand the mechanisms, where we understand how they're interacting and what are the things that they're changing, then we could have a more targeted approach for autism and for many of these other um, neurodevelopmental um, disorders. So um, I know you were going to ask later, but since I have it right here, maybe I'll say it. So this is one of the things that we're also studying. Uh, we're trying to, of course, do the clinical trial and help children, but learn through the clinical trial, which are the microorganisms changing which, which are the chemicals changing also. And from learning which are the microorganisms changing and which are the chemicals changing, can we come up with maybe a cocktail of microbes that are the ones that are essential or beneficial or fundamental that we could actually grow in the lab? Or could we come up with a, with a supplement that it's a metabolite from microbes um, that would help um, change some of these things. I'm more into the camp of microbes and I don't think it's one microbe. I think you need a team of microbes. Um, so some people might be thinking, well, you grow one microbe and then you use that one microbe, but it's the same philosophy as with probiotics. When you pick a probiotic, you want a probiotic that has the most amount of different microbes and the highest strength. Um, so here, if we can identify a team of several microbes that are important for ASD, and if we can start understanding what's the mechanism, what are the chemicals that they are producing, uh, maybe we can assert if these chemicals are also important for the etiology of some of these other neurodevelopmental disorders. Well, I think for phase two and phase three, what we're trying is the intestinal microbiota. So that's what AFD would be approving, not a separate cocktail. So if we find if we find microorganisms that we think are important, we probably would have to run it by FDA and probably do separate clinical trials for that. In reality, it's much easier if we could identify a group of microbes, we can grow them in a fermenter, and that's much easier than relying on donations from humans um, you know, it's, uh, if we could, but of course the advantage of getting these microbes directly from humans is that they're regulated by the human, you know, they're like, we have balances and checks in our body that, you know, that, that create this specific microbiota that you might or not have enough fermenters. So, you know, there are pros and cons of each approach. Yeah, but we're trying to learn. I think, of course, understanding which microorganisms are more critical will might also help us with, uh, you could also use FMT, but you could use uh, prebiotics or nutritional support to benefit the types of microbes that are the right microbes too. So that's by understanding which are the critical microbes that are missing, 
there are different approaches that you can use also to achieve your goal. You know, it's, it's difficult. We're trying to get to more specifics also with metagenomics, which is a more specific approach. Um, our sample size is small, so that's another thing to take into consideration. Uh, Prevotella is still a microbe we've been keeping our eyes on and big feet of bacteria. Other groups have looked at Clostridia and have looked at an overabundance of Clostridia, but this is not something we saw in our cohort, you know. We, we have looked specifically at, we have listened to the science and we have looked at microbes that people have paid attention to before also. And uh, it, it's not so easy with the sample size. We have to see changes, but I can tell you that with Prevotella, we saw very precise changes with Bifidobacteria also, and with the Sulfovibrio also. The Sulfovibrio is a microbe that it's uh, very diverse, can do a lot of things. And one of the things that it can do is sulfate reduction, which normally people would think this would be a pathogen, not a beneficial microbes, because um, if you reduce sulfate, you produce hydrogen sulfide, which is something toxic. It's not very good for the gut. Um, but we saw the sulfovibrio as one of the microbes that was a low abundance and came up after the treatment. Um, could be um, having some interaction with sulfur metabolism with these children, could be doing something else. We don't know yet. So we're exploring some of these hypotheses. So for the two papers that we published already, we use 16S, but we're using metagenomics also. This way we try to link how the microbiologists call it structure and function. So the structure of the community we can see and we can analyze with the 16S Amplicon sequencing. That's just the structure. And it gives us a high level picture of what's happening. Um, we can get into more specifics into the function and try to understand what these microbes are doing by measuring the chemicals that are there that are, they might be producing or consuming. And we're looking at metagenomics for two things. One, for deeper taxonomic classification, but we're also very interested in seeing if there are specific genes or specific pathways that we see more abundance of the genes that encode for, for enzymes that produce certain things or consume certain things. So we're trying to use this as a roadmap to help us create hypotheses and understand what's going on. So um, I can't say how often fast track status is given in general. What I can say is it's being given for autism. Because now there is no FDA approved treatment for the core symptoms of autism. The only two FDA approved medications for autism are treating irritability. So not a core symptom in autism. Um, and so we're very excited to receive the fast track status. And it just means that the FDA tries to respond quicker to us. We submitted a question to them last week and they have up to two months to respond and they responded within a week. So it was very helpful. Um, but uh, the next step is what we're doing now. We're conducting uh, phase two studies, which means randomized, double blind, placebo controlled studies one for children with autism, one for adults with autism. If those studies are successful, then the normal next step is to go to a phase three study, which just means uh, like phase two, but many sites around the country or even around the world. Okay, great. So you ask how often FDA provides uh, fast track status. I hadn't heard about it until our study, but now I know that they're doing a lot of fast track status for COVID related. Okay. Because <laughs> these are, you know, it's, it's a need, it's a big need. So that's something that it's happening a lot that people might be hearing about uh, because um, FDA is allowing, it's being a little bit more lax about using these drugs for COVID-19. Yeah. Okay, so it, it, is, it is an answer to a very urgent um, need. And of course, we all know that autism is rising in the U.S. and also abroad, but in the U.S., uh, specifically with one, one in um, 90, uh, 59 children, I think, who are diagnosed with autism today in the, in the United States. So, of course, your um, studies are very encouraging, and I would like to thank you so much, 
um, for taking the time and and giving us more perspective on how it works and and offering the the um, the hope that this could one day be a treatment for uh, children with autism, but also for adults, as you're saying, because you're uh, also studying a phase two with uh, with adults. So. Thank you very much for your time, both uh, Jim and uh, and Rosie. And of course, I can only say on the behalf of the Microbiome Foundation, well, we wish you the best of luck for uh, the continuation of your studies. And we all hope to be hearing from you very soon. So thank you very, very much. Thanks.